Hi, everyone. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. The Biden administration has unveiled a new pandemic plan saying shutdowns and school closures are no longer necessary. We'll have more on what the White House is calling the new phase of the pandemic in a moment. But we begin with the latest on the war in Ukraine. Russia is intensifying its attack on Ukraine as videos posted to social media show a missile striking the capital city's main TV and radio tower. A giant Russian military convoy is also reaching the edge of Kiev as Russian troops appear to have several other cities surrounded. Meanwhile, the humanitarian crisis in this war is getting worse. The UN says nearly 800,000 Ukrainians have already crossed the border into other European countries to flee the war and project that the number could reach 4 million. Let's bring in senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky in Lviv, Ukraine, along with ABC's Elizabeth Shelsey in Washington for more. Aaron, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. just spoke before the General Assembly saying that Russian forces are moving exceptionally lethal weapons into Ukraine that have no place on the battlefield. What are you hearing on that front? What weapons is she talking about? She's talking about cluster munitions and so-called vacuum bombs that the Ukrainians have said the Russians have brought to bear here. We haven't been able to independently confirm it ourselves, but the Ukrainians have consistently said that the Russians are using these munitions, which only increase the lethality when it comes to civilians. And already hundreds of civilians have been killed or injured. The Ukrainians said today it may be as many as 2,000, another number we haven't been able to, to independently verify. But it does show that civilians have increasingly been put in the crosshairs here. The Ukrainian president Zelensky said today that Russia was targeting civilians, even though the Russians deny it. But he says that, that Russian projectiles have hit hospitals and schools. Shells have been uh, heard falling in residential areas. That has sent more people scurrying below ground. And, and, and below ground has been fascinating, Diane, because hospitals have had to set up maternity wards in, in basements or in underground parking garages. One doctor in, in the eastern city of Kharkiv said four women gave birth underground uh, just in, in, in the last hours. Uh, incredible to think of, of what's happening as life must go on in certain aspects, even amidst this bombardment. Amazing, Aaron. And the U.S. ambassador also called for nations to vote on a resolution to hold Russia accountable. Let's listen to that. The United States is choosing to stand with the Ukrainian people. We are choosing in coordination with our allies and partners to impose severe consequences on Russia. We're choosing to hold Russia accountable for its actions, and we will soon turn to vote on a resolution that does just that. We believe this is a simple vote. Vote yes if you believe you and member states, including your own, have a right to sovereignty and territorial integrity. Vote yes if you believe Russia should be held to account for its actions. So Elizabeth, what kind of an effect would this resolution have? Is this just symbolic or can this come with real consequences? Diane, forceful words there really in this resolution that would demand that Russia withdraw its forces from Ukraine. This is largely symbolic. It wouldn't be legally binding, but it would carry enormous clout in the international community. Getting this number of countries on board to condemn Russia is yet another signal of how Russia is being isolated diplomatically. Very few countries standing by it at this time, essentially putting pressure on President Putin from all sides to condemn what is happening in Ukraine. The, the U.S. ambassador made a point of saying that this is a fight for democracy, that, the, that Russia's actions go against everything that you, the United Nations stands for. So really, this is a point to make that this is a united front in that belief that the U.N. must stand up for this in light of these, these military violations, the human rights violations that we're, that we're witnessing. And Aaron, videos circulating on social media verified by ABC News show an explosion overnight at an airbase about 25 miles from Kharkiv. So what's the latest on the fighting? Well, Kharkiv is one of five cities that the Russians have increasingly encircled, Diane. And it's thought that they could then, from those positions, move on to the capital of, of Kyiv. That is still believed to be the main objective of the Russians, to take the capital, decapitate the Zelensky government, and install a, a puppet regime. But how they get there 
uh, they seem to give themselves options. We've talked about a convoy that could come in from the north that still seems to be kind of stuck in its position. They have increasingly taken control of southeastern port cities of Mariupol and Kherson. That could mean troops come up from the south. It would be a longer way. But Kharkiv in the east and other uh, northeastern cities could also provide an alleyway for Russian forces to take the capital. And it shows why so many here are on the move. Nearly a million people now, the UN says, have left the country for safer ground. And, and on the streets uh, here behind me, there's so many things going on. I just saw a family pull up and spill out of a car all sorts of belongings headed up to an apartment for uh, undoubtedly coming from somewhere perhaps more violent. And then also on the street now, we see uh, police with long guns. I've seen them now that curfew has fallen, uh, checking papers, checking IDs. There's a real fear of Russian saboteurs on the streets. It's why people have formed up neighborhood watch groups. They've filled those beer bottles as Molotov cocktails, kept them in ditches along the side of the road just in case they're needed. And Elizabeth, a spokesperson for Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says Ukraine will send a delegation to meet with Russian negotiators tonight. So what's on the table in this second round of talks and what are the chances of a ceasefire? Diane, hopes are dim for a ceasefire here. As one U.S. official told us, these talks are a sideshow. Really, these negotiations are an effort to show that there is an attempt at peace, but really that's not what is happening on the ground. We heard from the foreign minister of Ukraine, who essentially said Russia needs to stop issuing these ultimatums. And President Zelensky has said they need to stop the attacks before we have actual conversations about peace. That is not what's happening on the ground, though, of course, these talks are going to continue. We are waiting kind of for what exactly will be discussed. No, no big hopes for some sort of breakthrough, though. And Aaron, Ukrainian forces have been doing all they can to resist Russia's advance. How much ground have they lost so far? Well, officially, they haven't lost any. You know, the Ukrainians say they remain in control of just about every major city in the country. But we're, we're starting to get some worrying word from Mariupol, the, the port city on the Black Sea and from Kherson uh, nearby, that the, the Russian forces have them surrounded. And uh, the mayor of, of Kherson uh, seemed to acknowledge that the city could soon fall into Russian hands. The Ukrainian defense forces are doing a, a yeoman's work, uh, but how long they can hold out against the much more powerful Russian army is only a matter of time. All right, Aaron Katursky in Lviv, Ukraine for us. Elizabeth Schelzi and ZC, thank you both. Meanwhile, the refugee crisis is worsening as the war intensifies in Ukraine. The U.N. says more than 800,000 refugees have fled Ukraine and over half of them have made their way to Poland. A massive volunteer effort is now underway there, offering those in need of everything from shelter to food and water, all the care that they that they need is the hopes at least. But some of these refugees are complaining of discrimination. Marcus Moore is in Chemischel, Poland with more on that. Hi, Marcus. A majority of the refugees coming from Ukraine are coming into Poland here where there's an army of volunteers arriving with food, medicine and clothing to help them as they flee the war in Ukraine. And this is an effort that has been happening across the, the region here. And you can see all of the people here ready to help and the food that is also on the site here. Uh, a shelter has been set up for those families, and many of them tell us that it took them days to just get across the border. Officials have said that they have opened up additional pedestrian routes to ease the congestion, but it is still a very hard journey. And we're also hearing reports that there has been discrimination targeted at African and um, other people of color who were leaving Ukraine. The United Nations Refugee um, Agency uh, has confirmed those reports and has condemned what's been happening. But it does give you a sense of the many layers of this humanitarian crisis as people flee Ukraine because of war. Marcus Moore, ABC News, Przemysl, Poland. Marcus, thank you. And coming up, President Biden delivers his first State of the Union address. Hear what he said about fighting for democracy abroad and a unity agenda here at home when we come back.
Welcome back. President Biden is traveling to Wisconsin today to promote his bipartisan infrastructure bill after delivering his first State of the Union address. The president also focused on Russia's war in Ukraine last night, warning that Vladimir Putin will pay the price for this invasion. And some lawmakers in the House chambers were blue and yellow to show their support for Ukraine. ABC chief White House correspondent Cecilia Vega has more. In his first State of the Union address, President Biden vowing to fight for democracy and make Vladimir Putin pay for Russia's war against Ukraine. Putin sought to shake the very foundations of the free world, thinking he could make it bend to his menacing ways. But he badly miscalculated. Lawmakers wearing Ukraine's blue and yellow colors and waving flags in solidarity and in a bipartisan show of force, saluting Ukraine's ambassador to the United States with a standing ovation. The president announcing new moves to combat Putin's aggression. We will join our allies in closing off American airspace to all Russian flights, further isolating Russia and adding additional squeeze on their economy. He has no idea what's coming. To blunt the impact of war and pain at the pump here at home, he also announced the release of millions of barrels of oil from the strategic reserve. And he had this message of reassurance in the face of the Kremlin putting its nuclear forces on high alert. I want you to know we're going to be okay. This morning, George asking the vice president about it's the best possible outcome. Does the United States want the Russian people and Putin's fellow oligarchs to rise up and depose him? Well, what we want is that, that, that he will leave Ukraine. What we want is that the Ukrainian people will be free and that they will be safe. But, it, but we are now at a place where obviously Russia has yet again invaded Ukraine and we must stand in solidarity with our allies and make sure there are severe and swift consequences, which is what we have been doing. But in these divided times, it was his praise for the strength of the American people that brought this chamber to its feet. The State of the Union is strong because you, the American people, are strong. We are stronger today than we were a year ago. And we'll be stronger a year from now than we are today. This is our moment. Our thanks to Cecilia Vega for that report. Coming up, the fringe far-right neo-Nazi extremists that have been fighting on both sides of the Ukrainian conflict for the last several years. Putin's call to denazify Ukraine was a false flag, but there are some very real concerns. Our in-depth report when we come back. Welcome back. Ukraine in recent years has relied on local militia groups to bolster its defenses against pro-Russian separatists. But some are reportedly tied to Ukrainian far-right political movements and include neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other fascists in their fighting ranks. Even though they're a minority, their involvement has empowered Putin to spread the false message that the goal of his invasion is what he calls denazification. This despite Ukraine's elected government having the support of the U.S. and other Western democracies. According to the U.S. government, a small but growing number of American extremists have been traveling abroad to fight with far-right militants on both sides of the conflict, and some fear they could return to the U.S. more violent. ABC's David Scott traveled to Ukraine last spring to meet one former U.S. Army soldier accused of doing just that. I still have my moments. Sometimes I'll just break out and cry. For almost four years now, Angie Crowder has been waiting for her sister's killers to be brought to justice. They ripped my guts out. We all want answers. Gone down in the middle of the night, the murders of Angie's sister, Dina Lorenzo, and Dina's husband, Danny, have since become entangled with the crisis in Ukraine. I want their story told. These were two fun-loving people, and their life was snuffed. After growing up on a farm in Oklahoma, Dina joined the Marines, where she served honorably before moving to Florida to serve fellow vets. She worked at the Veterans Center in Tampa, mm. and uh, she helped vets. Uh -huh. uh, if she seen a homeless vet, she'd give him a card mm. and say, call me, I will help you. Dina married fellow veteran Seraphin Danny Lorenzo and lived a quiet life until the night of April 9th, 2018. I tried calling her that Monday night. And she didn't call you back? No. That was unusual? Yeah. 
I had this really strange feeling. Kind of like when you know tornadoes are closer. Yeah. My hair stands up on the back of my neck. To make ends meet, Danny sometimes bought and sold goods online. That evening, investigators say, he responded to an ad offering several firearms and agreed to meet the seller. They changed locations on them constantly until they found one that was dark, no cameras, not a lot of lights. Roughly 40 minutes later, Danny and Dina pulled their red truck into this empty church parking lot and directly into an ambush. Local residents reported a sudden hail of rapid gunfire. And when it stopped, the victim's vehicle was riddled with bullet holes. 63 bullet casings were recovered by police. Dina Lorenzo was shot 11 times. Her husband, Danny, took seven rounds. When you think about your sister's last moments, that must be... She was scared. I know she had to be, you know? But it would be more than a year before authorities announced the suspects. Two former U.S. Army soldiers who were discharged. This is 22-year-old Alex Weifelhofer and 29-year-old Craig Lang. The two met in the Ukraine fighting in a far-right military group. And they called me and told me they had good news. They now know who did it. One was in custody, and they're trying to get the other one. I go, where's he at? And she goes, Ukraine. I go, wow, really? Last spring, as Russia began remobilizing on Ukraine's border, ABC News traveled to Ukraine and found Craig Lang living openly in Kiev with his new Ukrainian wife and child. He agreed to sit down with us, but refused to answer any questions about the murders in Florida, in which he denies any involvement. I can't discuss any of these things, anything about Florida, pretty much anything about my time in the United States in 2018. I can't talk about any of that. U.S. authorities are trying to extradite Lang to face murder charges, but Lang claims he's a victim of Russian propaganda and U.S. political persecution. A lot of the media goes around with saying that I'm a right-wing extremist, that I'm, you know, a Nazi or any of these things, and I feel that I'll be persecuted as being a right-wing extremist or a far-right person, even though I'm not. You're saying that, uh, that the, the extradition um, request by the U.S. is really not about the case that, um, that the government alleges. Yeah. I believe that the United States government intends to prosecute me and other veterans of this conflict here for our service in Ukraine. Lang is among the reportedly growing number of Americans who have gone to fight for far-right paramilitary organizations in Ukraine. During Russia's 2014 invasion in Crimea, Ukraine's army was in disarray and turned for help to civilian-formed volunteer battalions, some of them tied to fringe far-right political parties. We are starting to see uh, racially motivated violent extremists connecting with like-minded individuals overseas online, certainly. FBI Director Christopher Wray has repeatedly warned about Ukraine's far-right militias appeal to U.S. domestic extremists and the possibility that they could return to the U.S. more radical and violent. Putin chose to falsely claim Ukraine's far-right is not a minority fringe, but actually controls the government, using this lie as a pretext for war, claiming he's trying to rid the country of Nazis, despite the fact that Ukraine's elected president is Jewish. And Russia has its own extremist militias fighting alongside Russian-backed separatists in Ukraine including the Russian imperial movement, which has cultivated ties with American neo-Nazis and reportedly offered to train white nationalists at the far-right rally in Charlottesville. One important thing to understand about white power and militant right groups is that they are fundamentally opportunistic. So when we have a major sort of point of tension like we're seeing in the Ukraine right now, um, it's very, very likely that actors will exploit that tension. Lang first arrived in Ukraine around 2015. His six-year U.S. Army infantry career had come to an end after he went AWOL from his Texas base armed and drove 1,800 miles to North Carolina, where he was arrested for brandishing a gun near his ex-wife's house, according to local police. Did you leave the base and go AWOL intending to harm her? No. So I left the base. So I did go leave to clear my head. So I did 
actually go to try to see my son, and there was an altercation with a neighbor in which I was, you know, arrested for assault by pointing a gun. The Army discharged Lang roughly a year later, but he quickly found a new front line to fight on in Ukraine, fighting with far-right militias like Right Sector and the Asov Battalion. Militias accused of human rights abuses by Amnesty International with ties to U.S. domestic extremist groups. These groups like Adam Laffin and Rise Above Movement are tied to plots of violence back in the United States, sometimes mass casualty plots um, and sometimes smaller acts of violence back home. He explained to Ukraine Today's correspondent Andrei Sapulienko his experience fighting the Russian-backed separatist forces. In 2016, Ukraine Today shadowed Lang as he fought Russian-backed separatists. I came to Ukraine to come and help the Ukrainian people. Lang has downplayed the role of white supremacists and neo-Nazis in Ukrainian militias and denies being an extremist himself. But can be seen here in this 2016 photo beside a right sector member giving a Heil Hitler salute. But you're well aware that, that there are far right ideologies represented in the, in the mix, right? I'm going to say that the amount of like neo-Nazis or people with extreme views is very, very minimal. Very, very minimal. Is, is there extremism to a small degree? There might be some extremism, yeah. There might be. Either might. You, you don't accept that that's part of I the don't, reality? No, here? I don't accept that that's part of the reality here. I mean, I've, I've had black people in my unit serving alongside with me. Have you also had Nazis? Um, I've seen people that want to claim that they might be a Nazi, but I don't think that that's their actual ideology. It was in Ukraine that Lang met co-combatant and alleged co-conspirator Alex Zwiffelhofer, fighting against Russian-backed separatists in disputed territory on the Eastern Front. According to federal prosecutors, the following year they returned to the U.S. together and allegedly hatched the plot to rob and kill the Lorenzos in Florida. Zwiffelhofer has pleaded not guilty. Lang left the U.S. and eventually went back to Ukraine, where he says he now teaches English. During our interview, Lang grew increasingly upset with questions we were asking. I don't really, yeah, I don't, I don't see this conversation going anywhere. I see y'all well, are on a witch hunt trying to look well, that, for Nazis that true. don't exist. That's not true and that's not fair. And after speaking with us for more than an hour, when we pressed him about racist statements reportedly made by Andrei Beletsky, the former leader of a Sov battalion, Lang ended the interview. But when you served in Ukraine, he was the commander. For Asov, right? He says the nation's mission was to, quote, lead the white races of the world in a final crusade against Semite led. I wish you all a good evening. I'm going to go ahead and leave. Is that not, is that not I'm true? Sorry, guys. I have no We've been unable to speak directly with Lang since that day. But prior to Russia's full scale attack on Kiev, Lang's lawyer told us he would continue to resist U.S. extradition and may take up arms again in the fight against Russia. It is disturbing. Our thanks to David Scott for that report. We'll be right back. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.